Matt here, Warriors, coming at you with a, another video. Today, we're going to go over to Stashroom Ranges. I always forget that there are issues with the fundamental understanding of how testosterone ranges work and how vast the difference differences are. Um, so we're going to go to lab core right now. We're going to look at, okay, what's lab cores, uh, total testosterone range. And then, okay. Yeah, this is interesting. We'll look at their optimal. This is going to be hilarious. Um, We'll look at some different um, lab ranges and kind of go over, you know, what the differences are and how how you're supposed to interpret. Um, let's see. We've got volume here. We've got all kinds of fancy stuff. Reference intervals. This is male testosterone and GDL. And then they've got, oh Lord. This is just crazy. So the ideal or like, who, okay. So when we talk about testosterone ranges. These are developed by Dr. Travison who works for Harvard still, I think. Let's look, look, look this up. Dr. Travison. Pretty sure he still works for Harvard. Um, Travison, testosterone. Uh... had his information before and I've emailed him directly because I've actually talked to the guy um, Oh, this would be hilarious if he's also, like, not just a PhD, but, like, a PhD, which is even more funny. Um, harmonized reference ranges. Okay, so, Dr. Thomas G. Traverson, who goes by Tom, actually, which uh, I tried not to call him that. <laughs> to, to be nice to the guy, and hopefully I can get an interview with the guy. Um, <laughs> Just feels odd to call a doctor Tom. Like I don't know, it just feels feels strange. Um, like hey, this is my doctor Tom. Yeah, he's a testosterone guy. He does steroids. Um, it just feels weird. Um, I forget how I actually was able to come up with his information because his profile is not coming up. He's got like 50 titles. And this guy is high motherfucking speed. Director of Biostatistics and Data Sciences, Interventional Studies, the Hinda and Arthur Marcus Institute of Aging Research, uh, Harvard Medical School, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And this guy's high speed. Top flight security of the world, I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't figure out if he uh, if he's got an MD or not. But in, in any case, it really doesn't matter. Okay, so I mean, his this is his work. You know, he's he's the guy. Uh, he did that study that I had just read the 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 harmonized reference ranges, uh, you know, information and. Um, What's very important about this is what he told me directly is that the work that they do is epidemiological. So they take a group of people 
Um, the, uh, we'll go through it again. Um, harmonized reference ranges. So this is the law. This, uh, this says what's on every lab. And this is very important. So harmonize reference range for circulating testosterone levels in four cohort studies in the United States and Europe. Oh, Jesus Christ. There's only 100 participants? Oh, Lord. <laughs> so I didn't even read that part before. I just knew that it was epidemiological. This is even worse. Okay. Harmonization procedures were reduced in intercorporate variation between testosterone measures in men of similar ages. Okay, and that that, that completely just refutes the entire um, the entire range. That's just not how it works. So in healthy non-obese men, which was bullshit because they probably are um their BMI is probably still higher than what it should be, meaning that uh, you know, a BMI of of a uh, of 22 is still too high when your BMI should probably be way, way, way less. And if we looked at, um, you know, Norwegian warriors and uh, Welsh peasants or something like that, and, uh, you know, Italian peasants, you know, their average um, weight would be, you know, 150 to 110, and, you know, they look muscular, right? And that's not what American and European men look like right now. That's just not true. Harmonize 2.5, I don't know what that means, to percentile values. Oh, two, oh two, why isn't that in percentage? Why would you, I would just write it like that. 2% to 97% values, or 264 to 916. And why aren't they using free testosterone? I don't understand that. Um, respectively, age-specific harmonized testosterone concentrations and non-obese were similar across the cohorts and greater than in all men. Harmonized normal ranges and healthy non-obese population of European American men of 19 to 39 years old is 264 to 916. A substantial portion of the inner cohort variation of testosterone is due to assay differences. These data demonstrate the feasibility of generating harmonized reference ranges of testosterone that can be applied to assays, which have been calibrated to a reference method and calibrator. So what is super, super important about this is that one, okay, the study is a hundred people and there's 3 billion people on earth or something like that. How many people are on earth? Let's see. How many people on earth <laughs> like i was wrong it's not three billion i think it's just in china okay so it's uh you know set uh eight billion people roughly so it's 7.6 something so <laughs> and then let's see how many how many europeans on earth No, but that's not how that works. <laughs> it's, it's just coming up with Europe, okay? So, uh, is that seven? Europeans and American Europeans on Earth. Is there like a total number? Demographics of Europe. Uh, population of Europe, which is 746 million. Okay. Take that number. Population of America. And then... So there's roughly 1 billion Europeans, essentially. 
in like a total kind of raw number okay <laughs> and if we're gonna take the testosterone concentrations of a hundred participants of a four cohort study like it's not how that works like this is not how science works and so um, from one of my previous videos i directly emailed dr travis and i'm like hey got this problem trying to understand it this work that you're doing is epidemiological in nature so I don't understand how we're applying this to all people, right? It's not blood pressure. It's not, uh, it's not as concrete as, um, losing blood volume and risk of death or, um, just, just different outcomes that would happen that you could look at a lab and say like something is dangerous. And so I emailed the guy and his direct quote is, you know, the, the work that we do is epidemiological in nature. The harmonized reference ranges are a picture, meaning that it's a picture of 100 people <laughs> that he did in his study. <laughs> and the direct quote cannot be applied to individuals and cannot replace the judgment of a clinical doctor and doesn't impact the clinical nature of what a doctor does in practice. This is very, 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 very specific and very clear in the law. So what that means when we're talking about testosterone is that this number, okay, so we're looking at lab core. So this is total testosterone and the number, well, I find hilarious, right, too. So, so somehow on this bottom number, so 18 to 19, the low, the low value is 150. Well, then somehow when you go to your 20s, then the low value is 264. Like, really, dude? Really? So you're telling me that an 18-year-old with 200 testosterone is supposedly safe? Or 156? No, that's not how that works. That's, that can't possibly be how that works. Um, so that's a scam. Um, and what is weird is, so you get from this night, this 18 age, and then it just jumps up to 264, and then just jumps up to 916, based off of the harmonized reference ranges that Dr. Travison did. Well, why is there this this constant rate? that doesn't change, but somehow there's a constant right here. Like, it's not how any of this works. You can't apply, testosterone is not age related. When we have endocrine disrupting chemicals in the water, the food supply, the cosmetics that you use, um, the chair that I'm sitting on, um, you, know, you name it, um, is involved. So this is interesting. LabCorp's optimal testosterone testing. What is this? Evaluate hypogonadal men, 1%. And actually, this has been disproven. My understanding is that um, the idea of the 1% to 3% decline per year is not a scientifically valid concept. Now, it is true that the percentages are going lower. Yes, but that is based off of other epidemiological studies of populations of decreases of testosterone based off of environmental factors. And then you can't actually quantify, calculate total the amount of how many people are feeling like shit and having their testosterone ranges go low. That's my understanding. It's probably a fancier scientific way of stating that, but so this is interesting. Generally, adult male testosterone levels are typically at least 10 times higher than those of women and children. The Endocrine Society and American Society for Andrology recommends using a total testosterone measurement, preferably obtained on more than one morning sample, as a screening test for hypogonadism. What I love about this is like, oh, so... <laughs> We're going to do one, and then we're going to do another. Most likely because our assay is shit, and like our testing is bunk. Um, and then, oh, we're, we mix we mix up these labs all the time. They don't want to tell you that, right? So it's like, oh, well, you know, let's do it again, you know, and let's see what happens. Um, and then also, like, this, this magical idea of, oh, if you go down one number, then we don't have to treat you. So it's like, 
and a good doctor should know the differences between that like okay maybe you still keep to that you know do twice okay maybe protect yourself you know use some use some judgment in terms of you know keeping yourself safe to prevent any dumbass lawsuits but um <laughs> we we don't do that with doc i feel like shit i got shot and i need uh i need morphine um or uh Hey, I have this weird rash, and uh, it's kind of on my dong. Um, what, what do I need to do, Doc? And then they give you medications or whatever, and then um, you have a reaction to it. And then, you know, there's not this, like, whole weird, weird thing that happens of, uh, oh, we didn't take a swab, and then, you know, you know, doctor looks at it, and it's a rash to give you something. You know, like, Maybe you didn't tell them you're allergic to something, and then, you know, you're allergic to it. But then you try again, you find something that works. Okay, fine, you know, whatever. But <laughs> we're applying some, oh, it's testosterone, so we have to do it again kind of thing. Um, the first national lab to receive CDC certification, well, after uh, 2019, I'm not really sure how good that is. Um, <laughs> we, can, uh, we can go through that on a later date. Um, <laughs> so this is just their, this is just their, like, brochure for their like serum a assay which i mean i guess i mean it, we shouldn't even be using it I, I don't know it's just okay so they're free direct which i actually need to find who did the assay for this because so dr travis did the, did the assay for the harmonized harmonized reference ranges they're taking his information from that and uh let's see Ooh, here we go. Now this is some rub. This is something I uh I didn't know. Interesting. So LabCore has this chart and the free testosterone value which is in PGML, which my understanding it should be NGDL, but um I guess um <laughs> There's a bunch of issues with lab cores, uh, free testosterone value. So they're saying that the zero to 19 free testosterone value is not established. Now that is fascinating because that tells me everything that you kind of need to know about how this works. So supposedly the 20 to 29 is 9.3 to 26. Uh, I don't know about that. And then if this is PGML, okay, I'm going to look this up because I don't, that doesn't sound right to me. So 9.3 to 26. Maybe this is wrong too. Supposedly LabCorp's uh, assay uh, software is all screwed up to where you're supposed to be getting an NGDL value and it's giving you a PGML value, which makes a lot of sense because a lot of guys come back and they tell me these these numbers. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, that doesn't sound right. You, you still feel like crap. And I look at their thing and then I do the, the calculation and then, oh, it's, well, it's crap. And that's 0. 0.9 instead of like, you know, 9. <laughs> so PGML to NGDL. Um, okay. And then, what was that? Um, 26.5, 26.5, convert. Oh, uh, okay, 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 yeah. So, the rough estimation is that basically free testosterone is roughly two to five percent of testosterone serum levels in the body. Now, I need to find out where this actually came from. I don't really know where this concept came from. Um, I hear about it talked about. Um, I'm not as familiar of why, which is a good question. Um, and let's see. Okay, so that was LabCorp. Let's go to Quest Testosterone Ranges. So testosterone. Total range. <laughs> I 
love this. The third thing is LabCorp versus Quest uh, assays. <laughs> People are figuring this out. Like, yeah, there's a scam going on. Um, <laughs> none of this makes any sense. People feel like shit. And the docs don't have a, uh, a good answer for you if you're not educated in this, right? So, oh, here we go. Here's a different ref reference thing. We'll, we'll all go through this one uh, after we go go through uh, go through their their assay. Okay, so this is Quest Diagnostics, um, total testosterone, mass spectrometry, um, assay. So they're 12 to 13 is 14. They're 14 of age to roughly 18 is 1,000. Now, I, I actually like this. Okay, so this is interesting. This is a very important concept for everybody to understand and for your doctor to understand. What is very important about how they've, they've written this is that there is no minimum value of testosterone for someone between uh, freaking infant, uh, well, not infant, I guess it's from three months to 18 years old, roughly. This is the way we should think about it. This is a very important context. There is no low value for testosterone, and that really there's no high value. Meaning that if you're not optimal, you need to be replaced. Simple, period, fix the problem, hypothalamus, pituitary, gonadal access, find the problem, fix it. Um, if it means you have to be on HCG and testosterone for the rest of your life, well, that's what it means. Um, this is a very important concept to understand, and the fact that they're actually doing that, they're not saying that's how they're doing it, that's how you're supposed to interpret it, and that there, there's, you know, th there's, there's this number, which is a rough total serum level of testosterone that should be in the body. If it's not a thousand, it should be replaced, and um, that is really the way that we should think about it. I, you know, I, I I actually give Quest some some props on this. This is uh. They're kind of out forwards of this because just like that one that we saw with uh, with LabCorp, they're supposedly saying that someone who is a uh... yeah. So okay, you're 19 years old. You feel like shit. Your testosterone comes back 156. A doctor's gonna look at this and he's you know not educated on it. Oh, 256 during range. Well. If you're 263 and you're 19, then you're in range, but then you're 20 and you're not? Like, oh, how are you different than the 19-year-old? Or 20-year-old in this case. Like, how is that possible? What, what magic happens after you turn 19? None. <laughs> like, if you feel like shit, you feel like crap, um, your gut instinct and the gut instinct of what this what this lab should be telling you is that at 20 years old and if you're you know not a thousand there's a fucking problem and you need to look look at the um, hypothalamus pituitary axis you need to be doing MRIs you need to be doing a growth uh, a glucagon simulation test for growth hormone and you need to get this person on HCG. Um, and whatever other fertility medications, along with, um, you know, running their fertility labs, which should be the next thing that you should do um, before putting them on medications, um, you know, find out what their fertility actually is, and then begin on the road to replacement. That's not what this is saying, and that's what it should be. But and, and there's this huge gap between someone who is 17 years old and someone who is 30 where there's an educational gap as well, where there's not necessarily a pediatrics or a adolescent middle person who's doing this sort of treatment, and your endocrinologist or urologist probably isn't trained either on what the heck to do if you've got someone who's a teen who, you know, is screwed up. And uh, God forbid you're a Marine, you come back, okay, you signed up at 17, you're 18 years old, you've been in the shit, you've been shot at, 
Okay, now you're, all your hormones are fucked up, and now doctors are giving you psych beds, right? Like, that's a freaking problem. Um, so let's see. J. Clinton Investigation. Where is this article? This is what was listed as the... Um... Oh, so is that, is this the paper? Okay, this is this paper. Hypoposo? Hypofiso. Hypofiso? That means, we're going to look it up. Hypofacial gonadal function in humans during the first year of life. Evidence for testicular activity in early infancy. Total and unbound testosterone and Andro Andro ten and Andro Stendione? There's not a real way to say that. That's I suck at this. Um had determined um to 104 core blood, cord blood samples, the same sexual uh, steroids and pituitary gonadotropins have been measured in 46 uh, normal male infants, 27 to roughly two and a half years of age, and 34 normal female infants, 19 to 332 days. Testosterone values... Why are they using NGML? I don't get... Oh, whatever. Um, testosterone was 29.6 to 100... Oh, oh, is it the volume? I suck at this. Um, plasma total and unbound testosterone was 38. And then what's their conclusion? Uh... But they don't have a conclusion on their paper? What? Someone's screwed up. <laughs> Wait, come on here. You don't have a conclusion on your fancy paper that ended up in the NIH? Come on. What's going on here? In a minute. You're telling me you're writing a fancy paper, you're getting all this money, and you don't have a conclusion? <laughs> I'm not reading your whole paper. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay. Acknowledgements. Um, okay, there's a discussion. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of words here, and there's not a lot of conclusions. Um, <laughs> what the hell? Um, discussion. The values of concentration found in the blood cord and the present study are on the same range as those previously reported none of the previous studies for sex differences in testosterone demonstrated contrary to the present findings the considerably greater number of subjects and high sensitivity of the ria method used could explain the discrepancy blah 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 Yeah, the bottom line is all this stuff screwed up. Um, <laughs> so, let's see. Uh, quest 3 testosterone range. Are we still using PGML? I mean, come on. Did we really have to use that? Um, okay. Yeah, this is ho fucking hogwash. Straight up hogwash, tomfoolery, and um, flap doodling nonsense. Um, okay. You're telling me that a free testosterone level for a young man is 0.4 and 10? At 17 years old? No. <laughs> that is not how that works at all. 
Um, and then 18 to 69 years of age, which is 0.4 to then 22. No. <laughs> And by the way, I'm using NGDL. I'm putting the, the decimal over. So if you ever see a PGML uh, versus an NGDL, all you do is you just move the decimal point over. That's all that means. Um, and so this 446 number is technically 4.6. And then the, the 224 is then 22.4. Um, it, we just use NGDL because we use NGDL on total testosterone. So you just want to use the same metric. Makes sense. Easy to talk about. Um, Oh, so it's not established what your death should be of, of number of uh, when you get old. And then it's, <laughs> this is all screwed up. Like, <laughs> none of this makes any sense. And then where are they even getting this from in the first place? Like, where are they basing this off of? They don't even have a, a link or a, uh, a study like the other ones of the Travis and one and then the Clem study. They don't even have a study listed here of where they're getting this from. Are they just making it up? So something I thought was really important that gets glossed over that is directly impacting um, the way that we think about testosterone treatment and how patients then hear about it and what doctors are told in medical school. When it comes to the treatment the validation of the studies and combined knowledge. Um, Dr. Morgenthaler, who is the premier Harvard fancy guy, who's a urologist, who's the top testosterone guy. If any doctor ever says anything about testosterone, steroids, medications in general that can help you fundamental concepts and they don't know who dr morgan dollar is they're they're working off of flawed information and if they don't know it they need to know it because it's the law and how uh, it works meaning that they have done the meta-analysis and they're the ones who come up with the global consensus on how this treatment works so the paper is fundamental concepts regarding testosterone deficiency and treatment International Expert Consensus Resolutions To address widespread concerns regarding the medical condition of testosterone deficiency, male hypogonadism and its treatment with testosterone therapy, an International Expert Consensus Conference was convened in Prague, Czech Republic. Experts concluded a broad range of medical specialties including urology, endocrinology, diabetology, diabetology? Internal medicine, basic science research. Representative from the European Medicines Agency participated in non-voting capacity. Nine resolutions were debated and unanimous approval. Testosterone deficiencies will establish clinically significant medical condition that negatively affects male sexuality, reproduction, general health, and quality of life. By the way, quality of life is like kind of a thing in medical literature and how treatment works. Symptoms and signs of testosterone deficiency occur as a result of low levels of testosterone and may benefit from treatment, regardless of whether there's an identified underlying etiology. 
testosterone deficiency is a global public health concern. Testosterone therapy for men with testosterone deficiency is effective, rational, and evidence-based. There is no testosterone concentration threshold that reliably distinguishes those who will respond to treatment from those who will not. Remember that number we were looking at, that 260 number, where supposedly you're healthy one day, but then your birthday didn't happen, and then somehow you're not healthy? Yeah, that, that's what that means. There's no scientific basis for any age-specific recommendations against the use of testosterone therapy in men. Let me say that again. There is no scientific basis for any age-specific recommendations against the use of testosterone therapy in men men the evidence does not support increased risk of cardiovascular events with testosterone therapy the evidence does not support increased risk of prostate cancer with testosterone therapy and the evidence supports a major research initi initiative to explore possible benefits of testosterone therapy for cardiometabolic disease including diabetes these resolutions may be considered points of agreement by a broad range of experts based on the best available scientific evidence. So right there is like a shot in the gut to the whole entire medical industry in general that somehow you're 19, you're a Marine, you come back, You've been in the, in the suck. You're getting shot at. Um, or you were just a Marine and you got yelled at at basic. Um, or you're a traumatic uh, survivor. You're 18 year, year, year old lady. You, uh, you witnessed a horrific event. You were in a car accident. You were a welder. You fell. Um, you were working with your dog. Service dog like myself. You fall over. Hit your head. <laughs> your dog comes up to you. Oh, hey, you're trying to play. You're on the floor. No, you flipped me over on top of my head, and I hurt. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> or you're like me. You're out in Iraq or Afghanistan, and somebody's you know mortaring at the base. And it's not personal. You're just kind of you know shooting in your general direction, um, <laughs> and uh, you get blown up. Um, it puts a it puts a shine on a. Uh, on how we view things and 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 what we're what we're going after, which is that quality of life piece, right? That's huge. Um, you know that that's the these are the clinical guidelines and how this stuff works. This this study is going to come up if a doctor ever. Um, so with, with this with this uh, these numbers as well. So these epidemiological numbers, you know, say, say you're not responding to treatment, say you're doing everything the right way. So we titrate from hundred to 200 milligrams. Ah, it's kind of working, but maybe you don't get as much, don't get enough boners. Maybe it's the brain fog. You know, the untrained doc is not going to really do anything. Oh, the packet insert says, you know, hundred milligrams every four weeks, right? The, you know, these, some of these guys, you know, barely even, past their drug clearance uh, stuff in school, and they definitely don't remember any of the hormone stuff they did in school. Um, and they're not going to an expert, and they're not calling up their buddy. It takes five minutes. Call up a clinic, say, hey, I'm a doc. What do I do? It's five minutes of your time. They're going to tell you what to do. And, you know, there's, you, you can find that out. But, you know, someone's going to say, oh, I feel like shit. I'm on this dose. I don't feel good. Well, the clinically tested doses um, go up to 650 milligrams, which is then a cancer study. Um, now, we don't necessarily apply that to you know everybody else, but it's a clinically trialed dose um, that has seemed safe. No one died. Um, and so we use 100 to 650 milligrams of medications. You know, you don't you don't get a response from 300, 400, heck, even 600. Go up to 650. See what happens. Um, if your your blood markers are good, your your blood pressure is stabilized, your thyroid stabilized, your um, other health markers are within a a good range, your triglycerides aren't out of whack, and um, you still are moving. 
I mean, there's no, nothing to say that 700 isn't going to work. Why not? Um, you know, as long as you're with playing safe within the the trial doses, um, we're going for quality of life, and like, there's no uh, there's no age specific time that this is going to happen, and um, there's also no dose that is specific to um, oh, well, you are 18 years old, and you know, you're this, or you know, you are a uh, traumatic brain injury survivor, and you can only go to this. That's not scientific. That's not how you know any of this works. Um, I'm gonna go through here and find some other kind of stuff that's in this. Um, let's see, resolutions, testosterone as well established significant medical condition. Low levels of testosterone may predict increased risk of developing diabetes metabolic syndrome, contributes a decreased bone mineral density, is associated with increased all-cause and cardiovascular mortality, negatively impacts general health quality of life. The symptoms and signs of testosterone deficiency occur as a result of low levels of testosterone and may benefit of treatment regardless of whether it's been identified as an underlying etiology. Um, symptoms and signs of testosterone deficiency occur in healthy volunteers of patients who undergo androgen deprivation. These symptoms and signs revolve with testosterone normalization. Historically recognized causes of testosterone deficiency are rare. Ancoria CRPG, whatever that is. Pituitary tumor, recently teramed classical hypo... What does teramed mean? Is that a word? I think it's making this up. Pyramid? Oh, termed. Oh, it just looks weird because this next this we put it in. What? <laughs> Why the metallics? Classical hypogonadism. It just it doesn't look right. Classical hypogonadism. These conditions account for only a tiny fraction of men with testosterone deficiency. It occurs frequently with conditions other than classical causes. Classical causes would be a hypothalamus pituitary axis problem where you've got physical damage or something like that, or you have a, a pituitary tumor. Um, any doctor who thinks, oh, if you don't have a tumor, then your, your testosterone should be good. No, it's not how that works. We've got, epi you know, there's causes in the environment that can happen or trauma can happen the cytokines and attack you know different parts of the body and we have androgen receptors all over the body so there's not just one place that there is a testosterone signal no androgen receptors are developed and maintained by androgens and they grow by more androgens so the more androgens in the body the more receptors that you have and those are created and established and then you're able to then produce more testosterone that way so this is in the balls or in the ovaries you actually have other places in the body that produces testosterone so it's systemic throughout the body and there's different places that happen and then that's what um, allows you to have um, free testosterone ranges that are uh, that are freely circulating throughout the body because it has to go to target tissues around the body so it's not just one place there's not just oh it works on your balls that's what gives you testosterone no there are other areas where you get testosterone from um Testosterone deficiency is a global health concern. Prevalence rates of men from 2 to 38%. Holy shit. 38% in studies from Asia, Europe, and North America, and South America? I was going to say that's half the fucking population. What and motherfuck? Variation is in prevalence rates can be explained the differences in operative definition of testosterone deficiency and biochemical threshold. The U.S. study estimates an additional 190 to 500 billion in healthcare expenditures over 20 years due to testosterone deficiency. Uh, what? <laughs> what in motherfuck? <laughs> so you know, you would think in like a pretty shady, uh, you know, a country that might be America, that might have a establishment, that may have some um, elite people who make up the medical industry, who um, have lobbyists and they pay people to do things. And um, you know, you would think with five hundred and twenty-five billion dollars, 
of U.S. study in healthcare expenditures. Does this be kind of be on the top of their list? Maybe? I don't know. Kind of out there with, with it, you know? Maybe uh, maybe I'm crazy about that. Um, testosterone therapy for men with testosterone deficiencies effective and rational evidence-based. High-level evidence shows that testosterone therapy is effective, increases sexual desire and erectile and orgasmic function, increases lean body mass, decreases fat mass, improves bone mineral density, you know, kind of prevents you from dying. <laughs> um, strongly suggests evidence for improvement in mood and energy. Um, there's no testosterone concentration threshold that reliably distinguishes those who respond to treatment from those who don't. No study has revealed a single testosterone threshold that reliably separates those who experience signs and symptoms of testosterone deficiency from those who do not, nor will likely respond to treatment. Interpretations of total testosterone concentrations confounded by inter-individual variation. So that's the technical term. I've never used the I've never used the word inter-individual variations. It's like highly fancy and like hoity-toity. I don't know. It's strange. Variation in serum sex hormone binding globulin binds tightly to testosterone, moving it from the bioavailable pool. This is a very a very important uh, concept. If any doctor runs a fucking total testosterone number and tells you, "Oh, it's safe." Okay, you can get away with maybe saying, "Oh, they didn't know about SHBG or albumin." Okay, but you better be referring uh, your patient to someone else because um, the community is coming after you um, straight up. Like if I hear this one more time, I'm going to the medical board myself and going to report it. Like, no, that's not how this works. You don't just run a total testosterone. You know very well that someone can have a pituitary tumor. They can have uh, damage to their gonads. They can have all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and uh, variation of serum, uh, sex hormone binding globulin, and albumin eats up the testosterone. So you have this. So say you have two thousand total testosterone. Big whoop! It's all being used by SHBG and albumin. Now, it's an important process, and you do need to know those values. And if you don't run your your uh, free testosterone number, and someone's at 0.5 or even 10, or even 20, or 30, even 50 total testosterone, and they feel like shit, and they have all the signs and symptoms, we ch the guidelines specifically state, I'll just go over it when I, if I can find it quickly, I may have to do another video on this, but it specifically states we treat symptoms, so that's just how this works. Um, there is no scientific basis for age-specific recommendations against the use of testosterone therapy in men. The term age-related hypogonadism is questionable validity since the decline in mean serum total testosterone level with age is minor and primarily attributed to comorbidities, especially obesity. Oh, really? So even that, uh, even that concept of, uh, of endocrine disrupting chemicals may not necessarily be true. Now, it could be true in 10% of the population or however much, but there's a huge factor that's there with obesity, and uh, that could possibly be one of the reasons. Older men w respond well to testosterone therapy as a younger men. Increased risk of the risk of cytosis in older men requires monitoring, but does not merit withholding testosterone therapy if indicated. I was very impressed when I saw this, and I was like, oh, wow. Dr. Morgenthaler is the fuck he's talking about. And he deserves an award. He deserves to be knighted. Whatever. You know, he, he really did his work. Um, what that means is erythrocytosis, when you add testosterone in the body, it then requests more oxygen. And that oxygen probably has to do with sex hormone binding globulin and albumin. Not really sure what the association is there, but my assumption is that. It's asking for more oxygen. The testosterone needs to go to target tissues. Uh, it's like a rude concept. It activates the testosterone and pushes it towards the target tissues of where it needs to be. And then that's oxygenated in the blood and then moves things around. It makes sense to me. I don't know if that it works technically that way, but let's just say it does. And your sex hormone binding globulin is going up. You're then moving the testosterone to the target tissues. And that's what's actually providing you... Um, 
the mechanism of how your body is utilizing this. This also means that erythrocytosis is increase of oxygen in the body. It's what we want. We want more oxygen in the body. So when we look at um, your hematocrit levels, there's a self-regulating mechanism that happens with hematocrit. I have a friend who's in Colorado right now. We were talking about uh, hematocrit, and I asked him what his hematocrit was. He's like, oh, it's 53. He proved in real time that hematocrit has a self-regulating mechanism and that it is then prevented from going higher, even though my friend is at a mile high in the earth right now, his hematocrit is actually lower than mine, and I am at only a thousand feet. So it completely disproves the idea that erythrocytosis is bad, Obviously, you do have to monitor it because what they're talking about is that uh, with hematocrit, it's also sort of a mimic for other problems with cancer, other things in the body, but it's a gene problem and that's a hematologist problem. And so a, a blood doctor has to then run the blood and run cancer panels, that sort of thing, and then follow that for older populations that uh, could have something with cancer, but that's not how that works. Uh, just be, it's what they, they're meaning that increased risk of erythrocytosis is not a problem if you don't have cancer or you have these other things where hematic would be an issue for your monitoring that. Uh, evidence does not support increased risk of cardiovascular events with testosterone therapy. Two observational studies received intense media attention after reporting increased cardiovascular risks. Both had major flaws and limitations. One misreported results and the other had no control group. <laughs> so this is important about knowing the basic science and like also knowing how to read a, um, a study and we're like the average person to look at a study and they're oh this is you know this is bad oh no and they look like that that one we looked at where it was literally like a hundred people in the entire group like no you can't apply that to like whole population and that's how we get in trouble right low serum total testosterone is associated with increase atherosclerosis coronary artery disease obesity diabetes and mortality like and which means that the higher you are, the less you have of that. Like, come on, dog. Uh, reference several RCTs in men with known heart disease, angina, heart failure, should greater benefits with testosterone versus placebo, greater time in ischemia, and greater exercise capacity. The largest meta-analysis study showed no increased risk of testosterone therapy. Reduced risk was noted with men with metabolic conditions. No increased risk of ventrothrombotic events with testosterone therapy. The evidence does not support the risk of PCA. What does PCA mean? Serum androgen concentrations are not associated increased risk of PCA or aggressive disease is that uh, it's something um, the evidence supports major research initiative to explore possible benefits of testosterone therapy for cardiometabolic disease including diabetes a large body of evidence suggests lower serum concentrations are associated with increased cardiovascular risk higher levels are protective like that's 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 the shot right that's the, the <laughs> Like, it needs to be plastered on billboards everywhere. Like, higher levels of testosterone are protective. Like, <laughs> stop being a, fucker, a fucktard. Like, <laughs> testosterone therapy reliably increases lean mass, decreases fat mass, and may improve glycemic control. Mortality rates are reduced by half in men with testosterone deficiency who received testosterone therapy compared with untreated men in observational studies. Among men who received testosterone therapy. Those men with normalized testosterone levels had a reduced rate of cardiovascular events, mortality, and risk. So they put all these like fancy like acronyms, but then they don't spell out the other acronym. Um,
Yeah, I need, this is definitely important. So the symptoms and signs of testosterone deficiency occur as a result of low levels of testosterone and may benefit from treatment regardless of whether there is an ide identified underlying etiology. Clinical manifestations of testosterone deficiency arise as a direct result of low circulating androgen concentrations, free testosterone. Diminished testosterone concentrations may occur in presence of known underlying conditions or in association with comorbid comorbidities such as diabetes and obesity, or the cause may be unknown. But there's no way to test of endocrine disrupting chemicals yet. There are assays being developed, or there's other ways to identify um, garbage in the body, but that may not necessarily be associated with the testosterone part. Doesn't mean you don't treat it, it's just not a way to identify it yet. A state indistinguishable from testosterone deficiency can reproduce in healthy volunteers by pharmacologically lowering serum testosterone values with advanced state. I'm gonna go with prostate cancer is what PCA means. This is this is a military thing. You always spell out your acronym first and then use it. They didn't do that. Who undergo androgen de deprivation. Okay, so prostate cancer. Okay, yeah, yeah. You use androgen deprivation and prostate cancer. Uh, treatment, which I need to go over this with Dr. Jordan uh, Grant, uh, like technical urology stuff for testosterone. I am don't have a, even a basic idea about how this works. Um, the urology part is not really talked about and is very important, um, but is a very uh, complex topic. And any doctor who talks about it who's not a urologist just completely, uh, and anybody who's not Jordan Grant just toss it. Like, uh, if it's not from an expert with testosterone neurology, I don't want to hear about it. Um, it's just, it's too technical. The average person doesn't understand it. And if you have cancer, you've had issues with your prostate, go to Jordan Grant. Don't even trust anybody else. Just go to him. He's the guy. He's got thousands of patients, uh, you know, who have prostate stuff. Just go to him. He's in Paris, Texas, you know, work on that. No. <laughs> it's not an expert. You don't want to get treatment uh, from anybody who's not when it comes to prostate stuff and, uh, and testosterone. They're just not, they don't have the knowledge and um, they don't have the optimization knowledge either. In general, testosterone deficiency has been conceptualized being due to the effect of the hypothalamic uh, balls to brain access um, from the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism can be caused by cranial feral genoma or by Cowan syndrome. Pituitary tumors, granulodomos, uh, super Greek word, not really sure what that means, invasion of the pituitary gland, or prolactinomas can cause centrally mediated hypogonadism. Primary testicular failure can result from mumps, orchitis, Kleinfender syndrome, chemotherapy, or radiation. Very interesting. These long recognized causes of testosterone deficiency recently be termed classical hypogonadism. Interestingly, the underlying pathophysiology of many of these textbook causes of testosterone deficiency took decades to fully understand. More recently, additional causes of associations of testosterone deficiency have been recognized, including obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, infection with human immunologic uh, virus, Interesting. Chronic renal failure, certain medications, including long-term glucocorticoid opioid use. It is likely that additional causes will be identified in the future. Clinical response to testosterone therapy appears unrelated to underlying etiology. Indeed, all major testosterone trials are comp comprised of large majorities of men without classical hypogonadism because it's historically recognized conditions are rare. The recently published testosterone trials and recent, the largest randomized controlled trial to date found considerable benefits of testosterone therapy in population of men with classical hypogonadism. Thus, there appears to be no scientific basis to recommend restricting testosterone therapy only to men with identified underlying etiology. Although there is a value in attempting to identify such conditions when possible, our knowledge regarding pathophysiology of testosterone deficiency is incomplete, and we anticipate expanding our knowledge with further research. It is a matter of clinical judgment whether the first attempt to correct underlying comorbidities, such as obesity, or to offer testosterone therapy immediately. This is a very important concept to understand, and any diabetes doctor 
um, family practitioner, um, any doctor that has a population of obese people in tandem of diet should also be utilizing testosterone replacement therapy to reverse insulin resistance and any diabetic patient should also be on testosterone therapy as well because my understanding is when you're able to then work on testosterone you're able to at least limit the amount of insulin that you need um, and I, I, I'd go on a limb and say that if you're also doing carnivore or keto, then you'd almost reduce the need for insulin entirely, um, even in the type 1 diabetic. Uh, when you're adding these medications out, you're still going to need a certain amount, but you can reduce the effective need and uh, be able to bring that person to somewhat homeostasis as long as you're able to intervene in a way that is healthy for them personally. Um, and something that, and it will too, type 2 diabetes is reversed with testosterone as a blanket statement. So, I mean, it should already be used at someone who's uh, somewhat um, insulin resistant or somewhat uh, type 2 diabetic should already be on testosterone. The fact that it's going to reverse insulin resistance and, and reverse type 2 diabetes pretty much should be on it. Okay, so that was a lot of words. That was a lot of stuff. Um, oh, this is very, yeah, I've never gotten into any of the uh, percentages here of, of Asia or anything like that. And that's a very important uh, studies to be looking at as well, I'm looking at their ranges or looking at um, what's happening elsewhere in the world. I definitely want to do a video about that because there seems to be a issue with applying to different populations we don't really talk about it it's never we, you're always talking about um the studies that dr travis did on europeans but say you're a black dude or you're nepalese you're japanese you're samoan the actual range doesn't actually apply to you by the way that range that you're getting only applies to white guys so, um, pretty important for you to know Samoan, Samoan warriors out there, and uh, my ta my uh, my one Tongan uh, who listens to the show, um, any Fijians that are out there, um, the uh, the testosterone ranges don't apply to you; they only apply to uh, to Europeans. Um, I do want to read this though before we go. So I, I do want to get the understanding of this. The impact of testosterone deficiency affects symptomatology, but also been found to predict the development of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and osteoporosis. Conditions with serious implications for public health. One study estimated over a 20-year period testosterone deficiency could be directly responsible for approximately 190 to 525 billion in inflation-adjusted healthcare expenditures, particularly in regard to the effect of obesity. On a global scale, the amounts of an enormous public health financial burden in the U.S. study, only 12% of testosterone deficient men defined by combination of symptoms and testosterone concentrations of less than 300 NGDL received testosterone therapy despite adequate access to medical care. This percentage of treated men is likely much lower in other parts of the world, given the other benefits of testosterone therapy, not only for symptoms, but also for general health and metabolic conditions. There is an urgent need to study potential positive impact of testosterone therapy on public health costs and outcomes. That sounds like my job. I think I might even turn this into a job for myself. Doesn't sound like there's any one group that's doing the research um, and uh, providing the economic stuff. Um, which sounds like something that's pretty important. Um, I'm losing wind here. For my traumatic brain. So I think I'll go off to resolution four on another video. Um, I hope that you guys kind of grasp a little bit more about how the medical world is misinterpreting the data, is misinterpreting how we do treatment, is not reading from the experts and gaining knowledge, not grasping that the cardiovascular risks were associated with people who had underlying conditions along with crappy modalities which are gels 
um, that when we do testosterone therapy, like it talked about, we're treating signs and symptoms. We are not um, going off of a, a range and, oh, you're in the middle of the range, and then you're healthy. Like, no, it's not how that works. Symptomatology, quality of life. Um, there's no association between um, higher testosterone and cardiovascular risk. That's that. That's directly what the expert says. I trust Dr. Morgenthaler. He's the guy. Um, that the higher the testosterone, the lower the risk. That's what it says. That's what the evidence says. And the clinically tested doses are 100 to 650 milligrams. That's what's clinically tested. Any medical board tries to screw with you, throw that paper down. Are my patients not as good as cancer patients? Really? Tell me. How? Where, where does it say in any sort of guidelines that there's these magical bodybuilding doses? No, there's no such thing as magical bodybuilding doses. It doesn't exist. You're not blasting and cruising and, and bodybuilding if you're doing 500 milligrams. No. Higher the testosterone, the better you are. That's what it says. That's what I'm going with. That's the, uh, the, clinical, the clinical stuff. Um... This is Brad, TRT for Warriors. Please go on Facebook and join the group, which is TRT for Warriors on Facebook. There's a backup LinkedIn group for ever get shut down. Um, trying to keep things low and slow like barbecue. Um, trying to keep it as a small group of people. I think once I get 500, I'll set up like another group or something like that. But um, we're at roughly 100 and something people so far, and I'm trying to keep it uh, low and uh, easy. So you can always talk to the docs in the group. We've got 20 or so medical professionals, all different types of uh, medical stuff. We've got counselors. We've got regular dudes. Mostly we're all associated with veterans and with uh, law enforcement guys and dirtbag contractors like myself and regular construction people and trauma victims and, you know, you name it. So our group is uh, individual um, you know, members of people who come together and want to get help. And, um, you know, we're also welcome to all the, um, clinic owners, we've got clinic owners in there. You're able to advertise, which is totally cool. I'm totally down with that. Um, our goal is to have the prices open and out there for people. Um, and any of the regular doctors who, you know, are doing this, that are on the cutting edge. We want you in the group too. So if you're a regular doctor, who's uh, wanting to learn, or wants to uh, try to attract um, patients, please join the group. Uh, we need more and more regular doctors who are educated, who uh, are seeking out the information, and uh, who can provide low-cost treatment to patients who can't afford to go through the um, you know, testosterone clinics, which are great, which are needed, um, but you know, we do need more low-cost options for people. Um, so this is Brad from TRT for Warriors. Hope you guys are having an awesome day. Stay safe out there. Do your own research. And uh, have an awesome summer.